Hello everyone, I am Dr. Mazhar Ali. I welcome you back uh, to an introduction to the artificial intelligence course. Today, we are going to discuss uh, the machine learning, which generally refers to the idea where we are not going to give the uh, computer explicit uh, for how to perform a task, but rather we are going to give the computer access to information in the form of data patterns that uh, it can learn from and let the computer try and figure out uh, what those patterns are. So machine learning is an application of artificial intelligence that provides systems the ability to automatically learn and improve from experience without being explicitly programmed. Machine learning, um, focuses on the development of computer programs uh, that can access data and uh, use it to learn, for, to learn for themselves. So the process of learning begins with observation of data, such as examples, direct experience, or instructions in order to look for patterns in data and make better decisions in the future based on the examples that we provide. The primary aim is to uh, allow the computers to learn automatically with, without uh, human intervention or ass uh, assistance and adjust actions accordingly. And uh, according to Wikipedia, it is the study of computer algorithms that improve automatically through experience. So it is seen as a subset of artificial intelligence. Uh, there are a couple of uh, different tasks uh, within supervised learning. The one uh, we will focus on and they start with uh, is known as a classification. Uh, classification is the problem where if I give you a whole bunch of inputs, you need to figure out some way to make those inputs into discrete categories uh, where you can decide uh, what those categories are. And uh, it's the job of the computer to predict uh, what those categories are going to be. So machine learning is a very wide field and now it comes in a different forms. So today we will explore some of the foundation algorithms and um, ideas that are behind a lot of the different areas uh, such as uh, within machine learning. So one of the most popular is the idea of supervised machine learning uh, or uh, just supervised learning. So supervised learning is a particular type of task. It refers to the task where we uh, give computer access to a data set, where uh, the data set consists of uh, input computer pairs or output computer pairs. So now what we would uh, like the computer to do is uh, we would like our artificial intelligence system to be able to figure out uh, some function that uh, maps uh, inputs to outputs. So. We have a whole bunch of data that generally consists of some uh, kind of input, some evidences, some information that the computer will have access to. And we would like the computer based on uh, that input information to predict what some output is uh, going to be. And we will give it uh, some data so that the computer can train its uh, model. Uh, there may be an um, example of the weather uh, where we would like to predict uh, on a given day. So either it's going to rain on uh, uh, that, that day or uh, it is uh, going to be cloudy on that day. So if we really give the computer all the exact probabilities uh, for, you know, if these are the conditions of what the uh, probability of a rain Oftentimes, if we don't have access to that information, what's the probability of rain uh, and so on. But um, uh, what uh, we do have access to is a whole bunch of data. So if we wanted to be able to predict uh, something like, uh, is it going to rain or uh, is it not going to rain? So we would give the computer a historical information or we will in give the computer a data set about days uh, when it was raining and uh, when it was not raining and uh, task the computer to look for uh, patterns in that data. <clears throat> 
So what might uh, uh, that data look like? We could structure that data in a table like this, uh, like this table. So this might be what our table looks like. Where are uh, for a particular day going back? We have information about like the day's so humidity, the day's so air pressure. And then uh, importantly, we have a label uh, somewhere. Uh, the human has said that um, on this particular day, it was raining or it was not raining. Uh, so when, uh, when these were the values for the humidity and uh, pressure, like these values are for humidity and these values for, for, for pressure, uh, if we look at on the January 1st, this value is for humidity and this value is for for pressure, uh, pressure, the prediction is uh, raining, that is uh, uh, raining. Uh, but if we look at on the January 2, this data is for humidity and this data is for pressure and it predicts that it's uh, not raining. <clears throat> so uh, definitely we label these all things to get the results. We label this data as a humidity and we label this data as a pressure and we get a uh, predict on basis of two, two uh, inputs or uh, two data sets, two attributes as well. So does uh, that day uh, look more like it's going to be uh, a day that rains or does it look more like a day when it's uh, not going to rain? <clears throat> so in, uh, you can think of uh, this as a function, uh, like the function of humidity and uh, the pressure that takes two uh, inputs, one is the humidity and uh, second is the pressure. So we may call the inputs being the data points that our computer will have access to things like the humidity and uh, the pressure. So we could write a function uh, if we, uh, that takes as an input both humidity and pressure, like for the, this is the humidity and this is the pressure. So, uh, then the output is going to be what category we would uh, ascribe to this particular inputs, uh, 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 what label we would uh, associate with that input, either this function, for example, showing the rays, rain, and this function showing the no rain, and again, this function is showing uh, no rain. <coughs> uh, so the goal then of this supervised warning classification task is uh, <coughs> Uh, going to be to figure out uh, what does the function h uh, uh, looks like, like the here, if you look, what does the function h uh, like uh, looks like. So how can we begin to estimate given all of this information, all of this data? So what category or what label should be assigned to a particular data, uh, data point? Uh, we have two numerical values. One is a uh, humidity and the second is a uh, pressure. So we could try to we could try to plot uh, this on a graph that has a two axes and x axis and uh, and uh, y axis. And in this case, uh, we are just going to be using two numerical values as input. But uh, these uh, same types of uh, ideas it um, scale you add more and more inputs as well. Uh, uh, we will be plotting things in two dimensions. Uh, you could add even uh, more inputs and just imagine things in uh, multiple dimensions. So while we human have a uh, trouble uh, conceptualizing anything really uh, beyond three dimensions, at uh, least uh, visually, uh, computer has uh, problems with trying to imagine things and many, many uh, more dimensions that for a computer, each dimension is just um, some separate number that is just uh, keeping trick. So um, it wouldn't be reasonable for a computer to think in a 10 dimensions or 100 dimensions to uh, be able to try to solve a problem. But uh, for now we have got two inputs. So we will graph things along two axes uh, and x axis which uh, represents uh, humidity and uh, uh, here and y axis which represents uh, pressure. And here might be all uh, uh, 
the rainy days where each uh, rainy day is one of these uh, the dew for example these dew days and uh, <clears throat> these dew dots are here that corresponds to a particular value for humidity and a particular value for pressure as well so and then we might do the same thing with the days that we are not uh, raining so i take all uh, the not rainy days uh, fig figure out what uh, their values were for each of these uh, two inputs and uh, go ahead and plot them on the, this graph so and i have a uh, if you look here i have uh, plotted uh, the red uh, circles so blue circles here is stand for a rainy day these all uh, shows the rainy days and the red circles uh, show here the uh, not rainy day and this then is the input that my computer has access to all of this input and uh, what i would like the computer to be able to do is uh, to train a model such that um, if i am ever presented with a new input that uh, doesn't have a label <clears throat> associated with it uh, something like this white uh, dot here uh, within the blue circles so i would like to predict given those values for each of the two inputs should we classify it as a blue dot uh, or because uh, just uh, looking at this picture graphically so this white dot uh, belongs to the blue category or does it uh, look like it belongs to the red category so um, i think most of you would agree that it probably belongs to the blue category because there is a uh, there is a majority of the blue circles here and this white uh, dot is amongst uh, among all the uh, blue dots so why is that uh, because it goes to other blue dots as i told you and that's not a very formal uh, notion but it's the <clears throat> notion that we will formalize it in just a moment that because it seems to be close to so like this blue dot here like nothing else uh, is closer to it then we might say that it should be categorized as a blue so it should fall into the category of i think the day is going to be a rainy day based on that input so it might not be totally accurate but it's uh, pretty uh, good guess i think now uh, let's discuss uh, the nearest neighbor algorithm a very common algorithm in the machine of uh, machine learning so this algorithm is actually a very popular and common machine uh, learning algorithm known as a nearest neighbor uh, classification we commonly call it the k nearest neighbor or sometimes k n n so it's an algorithm for solving these uh, classification type problems in the nearest neighbor classification it's going to perform uh, this algorithm so given all uh, the data we just uh, looked at the nearest uh, data point a blue point or is that a red point like these are the blue point or the red point uh, and depending on the answer to the question uh, we were able to uh, make some sort of judgment so we were able to say something like uh, we think Uh, it's going to be uh, blue it's going to be blue or we think it's uh, going to be red for for these blue dots we may think that it's going to be red and for this red uh, we may think that it's going to be uh, blue uh, for example uh, even uh, if you look here this uh, white uh, so That, that is the definitely if you you know the machine learning it's the outlier and we <clears throat> make our decision that is a nearby red so it may be red and uh, if uh, this white is a here then it may be blue but we may even uh, uh, assume that it's a outlier of uh, blue so it may be uh, blue so likewise we could uh, apply this to other data points that uh, we encounter as well so um, if suddenly this data point comes about then its near a data is a red and definitely it would be the uh, red so uh, though when you look at a point uh, like this 
uh, white point over here and you ask the same sort of question either it's uh, uh, red or blue because it's a nearby red if you look here it's a nearby uh, red uh, so should it uh, belong to the category of blue points because the majority of blue circles here and this side shows that uh, it's a raining or rain. these sides show the rainy days so um, <clears throat> so even we may ask question either this is a blue or a red so should i belong to the category of blue point the rainy days or should i belong it to the category of red that it's the uh, not rainy days so now the nearest neighbor classification uh, would say that uh, way you solve this problem is to look at uh, which point uh, uh, it is the uh, nearest to that point. So you look, look at the nearest point and say it's a red, for example, at this point. Uh, if uh, you find it the white, you may call it it's the nearest the red point, and you may call it uh, it's a red. And it's not a rainy day. If it shows the red color, it will show that it's not a rainy day. And therefore, according to the nearest neighbor classification, I would say uh, that this unrebelled point that should also be read, it should also be classified as a not rainy day. But your intuition uh, might think that uh, that's a reasonable judgment to make that the closest thing is a not rainy day. So may is uh, well guess that uh, it's not a rainy day. But it's probably also is uh, reasonable to look at the bigger picture of things and to say, yes, it's uh, true that the nearest point to it was a red point, but it's uh, surrounded by a whole bunch of other blue points like these, if you look uh, at the picture. So looking at the bigger picture, there's a potentially an argument to be made that uh, this point should actually be blue. And with the only this data, we actually don't know for sure. We are given some uh, inputs, uh, something we are trying to predict and we don't uh, necessarily know what the output is uh, going to be. So in this case, we, uh, which one is uh, correct is uh, difficult to say, but oftentimes um, considering more than just a single neighbor, uh, considering multiple neighbors can sometimes give us a better result. <clears throat> Uh, so there's a variant on the nearest neighbor classification algorithm that is uh, known as the K nearest neighbor classification algorithm, um, where K is uh, some parameter, some number that we choose for how many neighbors are we going to look at. So the nearest uh, neighbor classification is what we saw before, just pick the one nearest neighbor and use that category. But with K nearest neighbor classification, where K might be a value, uh, that may be three or four and uh, so on. Uh, so definitely the closest uh, data points to that point. So we'll say it a little bit differently. This algorithm, we are given an input. Uh, choose the most common class out of the K nearest data points to the, uh, that input. So if we look at the five nearest points and three of them say it's a raining and two of them say it's not raining, we will go with the three instead of the two because each one effectively get uh, one vote towards uh, uh, what they believe the category out to, to be. And um, ultimately, you choose the category uh, that has the most votes as a uh, consequence of that. So K nearest neighbor classification, fairly straightforward one to uh, understand. So you just look at the neighbors and figure out what the answer might be. And it turns out this can work very, very well for solving a whole uh, variety of uh, different types of classification problems. Uh, now, sometimes it will actually be possible to come up with some line that perfectly separates all the rainy days from the not rainy days. If you look here, this line separates the not rainy days from rainy days or rainy days from not rainy days. So realistically, though, this is a probably cleaner than many data sets will actually be. So oftentimes data is a messy. 
there are outwires uh, like if you look here this is the outwire outwire this is also outwire and outwire uh, so there is a random noise uh, that happens instead of the particular systems and what we would like to do is uh, uh, still be able to figure out uh, what a line might uh, look like so in practice the data will not always be linearly separable uh, well linearly separable uh, refers to some data set where i can draw a line like this one uh, so where there are some any points that are on the this side uh, this side and uh, there are some not many points which are on this side but we can just say that uh, this line does a pretty good job and we will try to formalize a little bit later what we mean uh, when we say something like this line does a pretty good job of trying to make that um, prediction but for now let's just say we are looking for a line that uh, does as good uh, of a job as we can trying to separate uh, one category of things from another category of things uh, so in the rest uh, now try a formula is try to formalize this a little bit uh, more mathematically we want to uh, come up with some sort of function some way uh, we can define this line and um, our inputs are things like uh, uh, humidity uh, for example x1 is a variable uh, that inputs the humidity and x2 is another variable that inputs the uh, pressure uh, and our inputs are things like uh, humidity and pressure in this case so our inputs we might call x1 is going to be our represent uh, hum represent humidity and x2 is a going to represent pressure so these are inputs that we are going to provide to our machine learning algorithm and given those inputs we would like for uh, our model to be able to predict some sort of output and we are going to predict that using our hypothesis function where which we call h or we which we show with the h um, our, and uh, you can imagine if uh, we didn't just uh, have uh, two inputs we had three or four or five inputs or more so we could have this hypothesis function take all of uh, uh, those as uh, input and now uh, the question is what does uh, uh, this hypothesis function do like the, this hypothesis function what does this hypo function is do, uh, does do uh, so it really just needs to measure is this data point on one side of a boundary or is it on other side of the boundary and how do we formalize the boundary so the boundary is generally going to be a linear combination of these inputs variable at least in this particular case so what we are trying to do when um, we say linear combination is a take each of these inputs and multiply them by uh, some number that uh, we are going to have to figure out uh, so we will generally call that number a weight for how important should these variables be in trying to determine the answer like these are the w w shows the weights so weight each of these variable with some weight uh, and we uh, might uh, add like a constant uh, to it just to try and make the function a little bit different and uh, the result we just need to compare is it greater than zero or uh, is it less than zero oh, so uh, doesn't belong to one side of the line or the other side of the line so we are going to do a bunch of uh, math where we uh, take each of the variables multiply them by a weight uh, maybe add an extra weight to it so see if the result is a greater than or equal than the zero and uh, using the that results of that expression we are able to determine whether it's a raining or not raining so this expression here is in this case going to refer to just some line uh, some line and what the line actually looks like uh, depends upon uh, these weights so x1 and x2 are the inputs but these weights are really uh, what determine the shape of that line 
the slope of that line and uh, what that line actually uh, looks like these weights show that line so we then uh, would like to figure out that uh, these weights should be we can choose whatever weights we want but uh, we want to choose weights in such a way that if you pass in a rainy days humidity and pressure then you uh, end up with a result that is hypothesis uh, that, that is a definitely greater than or equal to zero and we would like it such that if we passed into a hypothesis function uh, are not rainy days inputs uh, then the output that we get should be uh, not uh, raining so we could just say uh, one for raining and zero for uh, not raining So there then are two different uh, approaches to trying um, to solve this type of classification. One is this nearest neighbor uh, type of approach where you just uh, take a data point and look at uh, the data points that are nearly by try and estimate what category we think it belongs to. <clears throat> uh, but uh, uh, another popular approach, uh, a very popular approach, uh, the uh, support vector machine. Uh, we are uh, not going to go too much into the mathematics of the support vector machine. It is also commonly called the ACVM, but we will at least explore it graphically to see what uh, it is that it looks like. And the idea or the motivation behind the support vector machine is the idea that uh, there are a lot of different lines that we could draw. A lot of different decisions, but decision boundaries. Uh, most uh, the decision boundaries are called hyperplane, uh, that we could draw to separate two groups. Uh, so, for example, uh, we have the red data points over here and the blue data points over, over here. Red data points for not rain, raining and blue data points uh, for raining. So, one possible line uh, uh, we could draw. Uh, is a line like uh, this one. So that this line here would separate the red points from the blue points and it does so perfectly. So all the red points are one uh, on one side of the line if you look here and all the blue uh, circles are on other side of the line if you look here. <coughs> so the reason why is that uh, uh, why we did this so definitely we want to generalize this these all things uh, to other uh, uh, data points that are not necessary in the data set that we have access to so for example if there was a point that fail right uh, right here for example on the right side uh, of the line then based on that we might want to guess that it is in fact a rate uh, point, uh, but it falls on the side of the line where instead we would estimate that it's a blue point. And so based on that, uh, this line is probably not a great choice uh, just because it is um, so close to uh, these various data points. So we might um, instead prefer a diagonal line and that just goes diagonally through the data set as we have seen before. Uh, for example, this diagonal line here successfully separates all the rate points from all the value points from the perspective of something like um, uh, just trying to figure out some set of um, uh, weights that um, allows us to predict the uh, correct output. So this line will predict the um, correct output for uh, this particular set of data every single time because the rate points are on uh, one side and the blue points are on the other uh, side uh, but yet again you should uh, probably be a little uh, bit nervous because this line is uh, what this line is uh, uh, so close to the red points even though uh, uh, we are able to correctly predict on the input data if uh, there was a point that fails somewhere in this general area then our algorithm would say that uh, yes it's a blue point when in actuality uh, it might belong to the red 
category instead just because it looks like it's close to the other rate point so what we really want to be able to <clears throat> say given this data how can you generalize this um, output as a based as possible is to come up with a, a line like this uh, uh, this line that seems like the initiative uh, uh, line to draw and the reason why is initiative um, is because it seems to be as far uh, part is uh, possible from the rate data and the view data so that if we uh, generalize a little bit and uh, assume that maybe uh, we have some points that are different from the input but is still slightly further away so we can uh, still see uh, that something on this side so probably we read something on this that side probably view and uh, we can make um, those just uh, judgment that way so that is what support vector machines are designed to do so they are designed to try and uh, find uh, what we call the maximum margin separator. Uh, where the maximum margin separator is just some boundary that maximizes the distance uh, between the groups of points rather than uh, come up with some boundary that's uh, very close to one side or <clears throat> The other. So whenever the uh, where in the case before uh, we wouldn't have a cared. So as long as we are categorizing the input, and uh, that seems all we need to do. The support vector machine will try and uh, distance, or uh, will find this uh, maximum margin separator, uh, some way of trying to maximize the particular distance. And it does, uh, and it does so by uh, finding that we call the support vector vectors which are the uh, vectors that are closest to the line and trying to maximize the distance between the line and those particular points uh, so it was that uh, way in two dimensions it also works in a higher dimensions where we are not, not looking for some line that separates the two data points but instead looking um, for what uh, we generally call a hyperplane, some decisions boundary effectively uh, that separates uh, one set of data from the other set of data. And this ability of support vector machine to work in high dimensions actually has a several other applications as well. But one is that um, it helpfully deals with the cases where the data may not be linearly separable. Um, so some data sets are not uh, linearly separable and uh, some were, were even two. So you would not be able to find a good line at all that would try to do that kind of separation. So something like this, for example, if you look here, uh, where if you imagine here are the rate points uh, and uh, the blue points surrounded it. So if you try to find a line uh, that uh, divides the rate points from the blue points, it's going to be difficult, uh, difficult. So if not impossible to do, that any line you choose, if you have uh, drawn a line here, then uh, you ignored all of uh, these blue points that should be blue and not red. So anywhere else you draw a line, uh, there's a going to be a lot of errors um, a lot of mistakes a lot of what will soon call loss to that line that you draw so a lot of points that you are going to categorize here so what we want to uh, what we want is to be able to find a better decision boundary that may not be just um, a straight line through this two-dimensional uh, space and what support vector machines can do is they uh, <clears throat> they can begin to um, operate in higher dimensions and be able to find some other decisions boundary like the circle in this case that can, uh, that can separate one of these sets of data from uh, the other set of data a lot better so oftentimes in data sets where the data is uh, not linearly separable support vector machines by working in higher dimensions can figure out a way to solve that kind of problem effectively 
And the classification, is, uh, the classification is only one of the tasks that you might uh, encounter when supervised machine learning. Because in classification, what we are trying to predict is some uh, discrete category. Uh, we are trying to predict the weight or value, rain or no rain, authentic or uh, counterfeit. But sometimes um, what we want to predict is a real number uh, value. And for that, we have a related problem, not classification, but instead known as a uh, regression. So the regression is the supervised learning uh, problem where we try and learn a function uh, mapping inputs to outputs. The same as before, but instead of the outputs being discrete um, uh, output, uh, discrete categories, uh, things like rain or not rain in a regression problem, the output values are generally continuous value, some real number that we would like to uh, predict. So in this slide, uh, we discuss an example, uh, which um, happens all the time. So you, you might imagine that a company might take this approach if it's uh, trying to figure out, for instance, what the effect of uh, its advertising is, like how do advertising dollars is spent translate into sales for company's product. Uh, so you might, um, uh, let's, uh, uh, do some example. So, the, again, the approach to solving this type of problem, we could try uh, using a linear regression type approach where we take this data and we just um, plot it. On the x axis, if you look here on the x axis, this, uh, we have uh, advertising dollars and uh, we have. Uh, and on the y-axis, we have a sales. So we might just want to try and draw a line that does a pretty good job of trying to estimate this uh, relationship between advertising and sales. And in this case, like before, we are not trying to separate the data point into discrete categories. But instead, in this case, we are just uh, uh, trying to find a uh, line that um, approximately this relationship between uh, advertising and uh, sales. So that if we uh, want to figure out what the estimate sales are for a particular advertising budget, you just look it up in this line. For example, this is the advertising. So why, why, what will be the, this will be the sale. <clears throat> So we would have this amount of uh, sales, just try uh, and uh, make the estimate that uh, way. And so you can try and come up with a line. Um, again, uh, figuring out uh, how to modify uh, the weights using various techniques to try and make it to so. And that this line uh, fits as well, like here, if you are counting the amount of uh, uh, advertising and what will be the sale. <clears throat> so with all these uh, approaches to trying to solve machine learning style problems, the question becomes how do we evaluate these approaches? How do we evaluate the various hypotheses that we could come up with? So because each of these algorithms will give us some sort of hypothesis, some function that maps inputs to outputs, and we want to know how well does the, that function work? And you can think of evaluating these hypotheses and trying to get a better hypothesis uh, as kind of uh, like an optimization problem. So in uh, an optimization problem, as you recall from before, uh, you are either trying to maximize uh, some objective function by trying to find a global maximum, or we were trying to minimize some cost function by trying to find some global minimum. and, and um, the case of evaluating these hypotheses, the one thing we might say is that uh, uh, this cost function, the thing we are trying to minimize, we might be trying to minimize uh, what we would uh, call loss function. So what a loss function is, it is a function that is uh, going to estimate for us how poorly our function performs. More formally, it's like a loss uh, utility by whenever we and predict something wrong that, that is a loss of utility 
it's going to add to the output of a loss function. And uh, <clears throat> you, you can come up with uh, any loss function that you uh, want. So just some mathematical way of um, estimating given each of these data points, uh, given what the actual output is and uh, given what a projected output is. So I'll estimate you could calculate some sort of the uh, numerical loss for it. So look here, zero and one loss function. Uh, so the L may be the actual uh, predicted. So uh, there are a couple of uh, popular loss functions that are worth discussing. Just that you have seen them before. <clears throat> so when it comes to distribute categories, things like uh, rain or no rain, counterfeit or no counterfeit. So one approach is the zero and one loss function. And the way that uh, works is for each of the data points our loss function takes as input, what the actual uh, output is, whether it was actually raining, we are not ra uh, or uh, not raining, and it takes a prediction input uh, into account. So did we predict given this data point that it was a raining or not raining? And if the actual value equals the prediction, uh, then the zero and one loss function will just say the loss of zero. So there was no loss. If the loss of the zero means there was a no loss of utility because we were able to predict uh, correctly. And um, otherwise, so if the actual value was uh, not the same thing as uh, what we predicted, so well then in that case, a loss is a one. And is a, if loss is a one, means there is a loss. But if the loss is a zero, then there is a no loss. So we lost, in the loss of one, we lost uh, something. But in the loss of zero, we just uh, not lost anything. So lost some utility because what we predicted was that output of the function uh, was not uh, what I actually was. It means in the loss, what we expect, what we predicted, uh, that we cannot um, acquire our prediction uh, went wrong. So the goal then in a situation like this would be uh, to come up with some hypothesis that minimizes the total empirical loss, the total uh, uh, amount that we have lost uh, if you add up for all these data points, uh, what the actual output is and what your hypothesis would have predicted. So in this case, if you look here, for example, if we go back to the classifying days or as a raining or these are the raining or not raining, and we came up with this uh, and decision boundary, how would we uh, evaluate this decision boundary? How much better is it than drawing the line uh, here or drawing the line there? So we could take um, each of the input data points and uh, each input data point has a label. So whether it was a raining or whether it was not a raining and we could compare it to the prediction whether we predicted it would be raining or not raining and assign it to numerical values as a result. So the zero and one loss function checks, did we get the right, did we get it wrong? So if we got it um, right, the loss is a zero. If you look here, if it's a raining or if it's a not raining, so if the uh, the loss is a zero, um, it means nothing lost. But um, if we got it wrong, then our loss function for that data point says one, like here, 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 here. And we add up all of uh, those loss uh, equations, all of our data points, to get uh, some sort of empirical loss. So how much we have lost across all of these original points that were Gautam had across to. So there, there are other forms of loss. If you look here, we lost a four. Is, if our accuracy is 100%, the misclassification is a four percentage. One, two, three, four. Uh, so there are um, other forms of loss as well. Let's discuss. Uh, what we uh, there is a L1 loss function. What we call L1, L1 loss uh, function doesn't just look at uh, 
uh, whether actual and dependent are equal to each other about uh, we take the absolute value of the actual value uh, minus the predicted value means the actual value what is the actual value and minus the predicted value <coughs> So in other words, we just ask um, how far apart were the actual and the predicted values. And um, we sum that up um, across all of the data points to be able to get uh, what our answer ultimately is. So um, look at this graph. What might this actually look like for our data set? If we do, uh, go back to this representation where we had advertising uh, along the x-axis and sales along the y-axis, our line was our, uh, our prediction, our estimate for any given amount of advertising. So what we predicted sales uh, was going to be uh, and um, our L1 was uh, is, uh, just how far apart vertically uh, along the uh, sales uh, axis or prediction was from each of the data point. So L2 functions uh, means that we could figure out exactly how far apart our prediction was from each of each other. So the L2, <coughs> L2 function is uh, one that quite popular is the L2 loss. The L2 loss, instead of uh, just using the absolute uh, value, like how far away the uh, actual value is from the predicted value. So uh, it uses the, the square of actual uh, minutes. Uh, actually minus predicted. So how far apart are the actual and predicted value and uh, it um, squares that uh, value uh, effectively penalizing much uh, more harshly anything that is worse predict, uh, prediction. So you imagine if you have uh, two data points uh, that you predict, uh, predict as being one value away from uh, their actual value as opposed to one data point that you predict as being two away from uh, its actual value. The L2 loss function will more harshly penalize that one that is uh, two away uh, because it's going to square however uh, much the, uh, however much the differences between the actual value and the predicted value. So depending on the situation, you might want to choose a, uh, last function depending on what you care about minimizing. So if you care about minimizing the error on more outlier cases, then you might want to consider the something like this. But if you have got um, uh, a lot of outliers and you don't uh, necessarily care about modeling them, then uh, maybe an L1 last function. Uh, but uh, there are trade-offs here that you need to decide based on a particular set of data. So what do you do when the risk of uh, with any of these loss functions with the anything that we are trying to do is a problem known as overfitting. And overfitting is a big problem that you can encounter in a machine learning, which happens any time a model fits closely uh, with the data set and um, as a result fails to generalize. So we would like our uh, model to be able to accurately predict data and uh, input and output pairs for uh, the data that uh, we have access to. So, uh, but the reason we wanted to do so is the, to, uh, we want our model to generalize well to data that we haven't seen before. I would like to take data from the past year of uh, whether it was uh, raining and not raining and use that data to generalize it towards the future. So to say in the future, is it going to be raining or not going to be raining? Or if I have a whole bunch of the data on what comes uh, counterfeit or um, not counterfeit, so US dollar bills looked uh, like in the past when people have encountered them. So I would like to train the computer to be able to in the future generalize to uh, other dollar bills that I might see as well. And the problem with the overfitting is that if you try and 
tie yourself too closely to the data set that you are um, training your model and you can um, end up not generalizing very well. So what does this look like? Uh, we might imagine the rainy days and not rainy days. Uh, example again from here. So where the blue points here uh, indicate rainy days and the red points here, the not rainy days. And um, we decided that uh, we felt pretty comfortable with trying a line like this as the uh, decision. And this line is a decision boundary between the rainy days and not rainy days that we can pretty comfortably say that points on this side um, are more likely to be rainy days and points on this side are more likely to be not uh, rainy days. But there's a problem if you look uh, this one. So if you really wanted to try and find a hypothesis that resulted in minimizing the loss, uh, you could come up with a different decision boundary. It wouldn't be a line, but uh, it would look something like this. So is a, this is not a line, but this um, we occupy the outlier uh, or as a radar circle outlier. So this decision boundary does separate all of the rate points from all of the blue points because the rate points fall on this side of uh, this decision boundary. The blue points uh, fall on the other side of the decision boundary. But this we would probably urge is not as good of prediction. So even though it seems to be more accurate based on all of uh, the available training data that we have for training uh, this machine learning model. So we might say that it's probably not going to generalize uh, well. So what if um, there were other data points like here and uh, there we might just want to consider those to be rainy days because it's among the rainy day circles. Okay. So if the only thing you care about is minimizing the loss on the data uh, you have available to you, uh, you run the risk of overfitting and this can happen in the uh, misclassification, means uh, what is the error of your model. Oftentimes uh, when you are doing a machine learning experiment, when you are, uh, you have got some data and uh, you want to try and come up with um, some functions that uh, it's given some inputs so what the output is going to be. You should, uh, don't necessarily want to do your training input, what the output is going to be. So you don't necessarily want to do your training on all of the data you have available to you. So that you could employ a method known as a hold uh, out class validation, where in a hold out class validation, we split up our data, we split up our data into training and test data sets. So what is a training data set? A training data set is the set of data that we are going to use the uh, train our uh, machine learning model. And the testing set is the set of data that we are going to use in order to test to see how well our machine learning model actually performed. So the learning happens on the training set. Uh, we figure out what the parameters should be and we figure out uh, what the right model is. And uh, what we see all right now that uh, we have trained the model, see how well it uh, does it uh, predicting things and inside of the um, the testing set, some set of the data that uh, we have, haven't um, seen before. And the hope then is that uh, we are going to be able to predict the testing set uh, pretty well if uh, we are able to generalize based on the training data set. So in training data set, we train the model uh, and in testing data set, we test the trained model. Either it's performing uh, well or not well. Uh, one of the downsides of uh, this just a whole class validation is if you say, I just split it 50-50. Uh, so I train using 50% of the data and test using the 50% or you could choose other percentage as well. For example, I used to train the model with 60% of data uh, and uh, test it with the 40% of the data. And sometimes even 
um, I tried to train the model with 50% of data and 50% test. And uh, one time I tested the model with 40% of data and used the 60% stage for uh, test. So it uh, it depend on you. So what are you going to do uh, how, with how much data you are going to train your model? So. So one approach is known as in the K-fold cross-validation. In K-fold cross-validation, rather than just divide things into two sets and run one experiment, we divide things into K different sets and maybe one divide things up into 10 different sets. And I think I used to assign the K 10. So if I split up my data into 10 different sets of data, then what I will do to uh, do is each time for each of my 10 experiments, I will hold out one of those sets of data where I will say, uh, let me train my model on these nine sets and then test to see how well uh, predicts on set number 10 and then uh, pick another set of uh, nine sets to train on and then test it on uh, <clears throat> the other one that I held out. So where each time I train uh, the model on average, um, everything minus the one set that I am holding out and then test to see uh, how well our model performs on the test that I did hold out. Uh, and what you end up getting is uh, 10 different results. So 10 different answers for how accurately your model worked. And uh, oftentimes you can uh, just take the average of uh, those 10 to get uh, an uh, approximation for how well we think our model performs our R. But uh, the key idea is uh, separating the training data from the testing data because you want to test your model uh, and data that is uh, different from uh, that you trained the model on. So because the training you want to uh, avoid overfitting, you want to be able to generalize and the way you test uh, whether you are able to generalize and is by looking at uh, some data that uh, you haven't seen before and seeing how well we are actually uh, able to perform. And so if um, uh, we want to actually implement any of these techniques inside, uh, inside of uh, programming language like Python, a number of ways we could uh, do that. So we could uh, write this from scratch on our own, but uh, there are libraries out there that allows us to take advantage of existing implementation of these algorithms. So that we can use the same types of algorithm in a lot of different situations. And so there is a library, a uh, very popular one known as a scikit. So, which allows us in Python to be able to uh, very quickly uh, get set up with a lot of these different machine learning models. <clears throat> so, Scikit is a, probably the most useful library for machine learning in Python. Uh, the, the SQL Learn library contains a lot of uh, efficient tools for machine learning and statistical modeling, including classification, regression, clustering, and and dimensionality reduction. So scikit-learn uh, scikit comes uh, loaded with a lot of features. So here are a few of them to help you understanding the spread like the supervised learning algorithm, cross validation and um, unsupervised learning validation and several others. So, Dear students, we try and solve those problems using several different methods such as uh, data and uh, learn uh, patterns in the data, whether they're trying to find neighboring data points that are similar or trying to minimize some sort of loss function. So there are any number of other techniques that allow us to begin to try to solve these sorts of uh, problems. <clears throat> so, Next time, uh, we will continue this conversation about machine learning, especially the unsupervised learning. So thank you for watching this lecture. Take care. Allah Hafiz.